Hello, everybody. Hang on to your seatbelts. You're about to meet Allison Taylor and Brian Harwood. Both are affiliated with Ethical Systems, located in the NYU School of Business. Ethical Principles is founded on the principle that good ethics is good business. Let me say that again and make it into a question. Is good ethics good business? Do corporations really believe that if they act ethically, their businesses will improve? Should they engage in ethical pr practices to increase their revenues only, or should they engage for its own sake? I found Allison and Brian through a publication they wrote called Incentivizing ESG, What Does It Take? ESG stands for Environment, Social, and Governance Principles. So what is ESG? So when we talk, the E stands for mm -hmm. environment, climate, the climate crisis, environmental sustainability, for example. The S stands for social concerns, human rights, diversity, consumer protection, animal welfare fits in there. And then corporate governance includes employee relations, executive compensation, employee compensation, how the business is structured, how the business invests. So when we talk about ESG throughout this, we're talking about the environment, social and governance concerns and corporate responsibilities for those. Here are Allison and Brian. Hello, everybody. I am super excited to bring you this podcast and conversations on what I used to think was what I'm used to calling corporate social responsibility that has now evolved into environment, social, and governance responsibility. I am so pleased to bring to you Allison Taylor and Brian Har Harwood, both of whom are experts in the field and who have written articles on what it takes for corporations to truly adopt a socially responsible, holistic is the word that's used, approach to what they're doing. Just as a bit of background for some of the, you don't know this, corporations used to think and talk about their primary mission was to provide value to the stakeholders. In other words, to make money. So welcome to both of you. Welcome, Allison. Thanks so much for having me. And welcome, Brian. Thank you. Good to be here. Great. So let's start off with your backgrounds. As I've explained, and you know, this podcast focuses on leadership for racial and social justice. So what do you know about racial justice, social justice? What kind of communities did you go in? Tell us a little bit about your background and let's begin with Allison. Sure, so it's a good question. I grew up in South London in the UK. I grew up in a very, very multicultural community. I went to a girls high school in South London that was very, very mixed, uh, all girls, but very mixed um, ethnicities, mixed cultures, uh, lots of uh, Jamaican Londoners, uh, lots of South Asians, um, lots of people of all um, kind of different um, different backgrounds. My mother is a teacher of the deaf, so I was also grew up around a lot of deaf children um, and children with handicaps and uh, was very much kind of brought up in the household um, mm. that these things were very, very important. Um, I was quite badly behaved, so then I was sent to another school um, from 16 to 18, and then I went to Oxford University, which your uh, listeners probably know, is very, very white. And my college was also not just very, very white, but very, very male. There were about, it was about 
eight or nine to one men to women uh, in the college that I went to. Wow. So I moved from a from an environment that was very diverse to an environment that was very much less diverse. Um, and that experience has really influenced my entire career because what I saw was that there was no, um, I knew some highly intelligent people from very underprivileged backgrounds that didn't seem to have a lot of opportunity. And then later I encountered people um, who did not seem any more intelligent or more capable, but had access to a ton of privilege yes, um, and were going to go on to be wildly more successful and rich. And that struck me as uh, incredibly unfair. Um, so then the rest of my career, I've lived in a lot of countries. I worked in the Middle East and Africa. Then I moved to New York. I worked in the Americas. Um, and I have been, uh, I think, in very kind of white professional environments ever since. Um, but I think it's egregious and I don't think uh, it's sensible. So that's a pretty brief summary. I'm pretty old, but that's a pretty brief summary um, of my upbringing. <laughs> well, you've had a range of experiences and it's hard to pack all of that in the intro so you did it and I thank you okay Brian so um I was born in Dayton Ohio uh, lived there for quite a long time and there the diversity I would describe as as pretty limited um I would say uh white and black were very very prevalent but not much else and so to me growing up, actually the, the idea of we racially was actually a mix of white and black, I would say, um, but I didn't have as much exposure to other cultures. So um, that was probably a limitation there. When I went to college in uh, at Wright State, which is nearby as well, it's not in Dayton, but in the same area, um, there was a really unique cultural experience there because of a large number of immigrants uh, students, well, some were immigrants, some were just students on visas from India, a very large number. And it was a controversy at the school, the, the number of students, the nature of the program and things like that. Um, and, and we had issues like things with uh, hiring for new jobs. Sometimes these jobs were dominated by the incoming Indian students. And some people had a problem with that. And we had to deal with um, where to draw those lines about um, how people get access to the jobs, especially those who need them to stay in the country. Um, and so there were some real interesting issues there that we had to deal with um, because there was definitely a racial component to who should be getting the student jobs. And it became a very uh, obvious issue that we had to deal with. And um, so there were opportunities there also. I was at one point hiring for a laboratory to be someone who said, I'm not going to choose based on those characteristics and to ignore them. Um, but it was uh, a more complicated issue in many ways. So that was sort of an early um, exposure to those sorts of ideas. Um, later I moved to- Hang on uh, a minute. When you said sure. we meant black and white, were black and white at the time uh, united? Do you know if the black people felt the we or just the white people felt the we? I'm not optimistic enough to think that everyone felt that way. I think it's something I came to know later when exploring things like unconscious biases. Um, you know, I, I felt that the the group that I that I thought of as just who I was and where I came from, you know, as a result of where you live, um, was that mixture. Whereas um, I later moved to Southern California, I was much less familiar with um, the culture that I saw there from a Hispanic Mexican culture. And it was all very new to me. But uh, where I grew up, I thought it was just, you know, you think where you grew up is normal. And and to me, that mix was was pretty normal. And the, the more worldwide diversity, I didn't get a ton of that until college. But uh, uh, does that make sense? I mean, I think you just, you know who your neighbors and your friends are, and that feels like we. Um, and, and people you know less about, uh, maybe not as much. Uh, and... And there isn't there isn't an other so much, but a lack of exposure. Okay, I okay. Yeah. So what I'm getting, and you can correct me, is that you grew up thinking everybody's we're friends and neighbors, black and white. There's no nothing to discuss really. And then you, as you move forward in life, you gain experience to say, oh, oh, there is something, a difference here that I need to pay attention to or know, at least know about. 
Yeah, I think that's true as well as culture has shifted to greater awareness of those areas. Um, there was almost the thought that things maybe were better than they were or that it wasn't an issue to talk about um, and we've become much more conscious. So uh, I don't know how personal it is or how cultural it is, uh, but, okay. but that's something that I noticed anyways. It, it, it wasn't a huge issue for me as a child growing up, sure. but that may not be true for everyone of every color in the same city. It felt to me like we, but I don't know that, like you said, everyone felt that way. And yeah. It's hard to say. Um, I don't want to speak for them on that. Uh, my guess is there was a lot, uh, a lot of people who felt very differently about that. Yeah. Uh, my experience is that people did feel differently about that, but it wasn't a discussable at that time. It wasn't something people were free to talk about. And so uh, sure. those who felt not included or excluded talked about it among ourselves, I say, but very rarely talked about it with the white community. So, okay, but you, and it was later that when you got more immigrant experience and exposure, you realized the problems in that area. Yeah, so um, by moving to a more diverse area and also through travel, uh, definitely open my eyes a little bit to some of the additional issues and got to know uh, greater diversity of people. Um, I know that I, I sought out a culture that was different from the one I grew up in. I didn't particularly enjoy the Midwest culture as a person. I knew that it wasn't a perfect fit for me. So um, I felt more comfortable in Southern California, for example, uh, that that was a better cultural fit. And it came with, came with it, you know, different demographics and, and different uh, experiences. So let's talk about ESG. First of all, Allison, please define it. What is ESG and why should we care? Uh, I would define ESG as, the, as what happens when the investment and financial services community gets hold of the idea of corporate social responsibility um, or what used to be called sustainability. So I would tell a story that corporate social responsibility originated in the 1960s. It developed as a result of reputational pressures on business and was essentially business leaders saying, don't worry, you don't need to regulate us. We've got it covered. We want to do the right thing because we like doing the right thing. Uh, the term sustainability, I believe, comes from the Brundtland Report, which I think was uh, written in 1987 by the UN. And that has a definition of sustainability of, of working within the Earth's natural resources and also um, not um, undermining the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So it was a definition around environmental responsibility and also uh, tackling inequality and poverty. And so very, very much um, an agenda with a moral um, and, and ethical component. Um, and that uh, was also the era of socially responsible investing. So the idea that we ought to be uh, deploying capital to, um, solve some of these problems but at the time the idea was that that meant uh, a more constrained portfolio and it meant lower returns now uh in uh, the hang on a minute uh, the quick you said it was of some report and what you said the Brundtland was... report yes okay uh spell that b-r-u-n uh i think there's a d-t-l-a-n-d Grant lip report. Okay. All right. Okay. So, Brian. So, in, sorry, I hadn't finished. In the oh, okay. 2000s, okay. Uh, then the investment community started to ask, say, well, maybe if we do the right thing and we do something environmentally and socially responsible, maybe businesses will make more money. And so ESG is an effort to... Uh, to measure and codify those efforts in a way that is lucrative for the financial services community. So the, the goal, okay, we, I'm getting some contradictory things here. On the one hand, it's a moral approach. On the other hand, the goal is to increase profits. 
I'm, I'm telling a story that started with business leaders trying to deflect reputational pressure okay. by saying they would voluntarily do the right thing, give to charity, invest in communities, things that are not good for shareholder value, but right. were designed to deflect regulation. Right. Then there was the rise of the idea that business caused a lot of the world's problems. This coincided with globalization. It coincided with a lot of rising public concern over things like sweatshop labor and companies trying to avoid regulation by globalizing and going to countries uh, the, where they could exploit the local population and where the laws were not as strong. Okay. So that movement had a very strong moral and ethical component and it got more and more, um, it emerged more and more into the mainstream. And then in 2005 or so, the investment community got hold of this idea and started to look for ways to um, correlate environmental and social responsibility with making more money. So I would define ESG as the financialization of sustainability. And that's where we are at the moment. BlackRock and the biggest investors in the world hang, uh, have, hang have decided this is a win-win for business and society. Okay. So you said financialization of sustainability as okay so in other words does that mean the moral imperative is gone or does that mean we want to measure the results what is what does that phrase mean uh well i think that the, um it, investors uh yes are trying very very hard to remove the moral component of this they are saying that there is a long-term business case to fighting climate change they say that more diverse teams get better financial results. They say that because the public wants to buy more environmentally and socially responsible products, there is a business case for going into this area. So yes, the investment community is trying to take the moral component out, uh, though, though I suppose a more accurate way to put it is the investment community is trying to tell a story that we can have both morals and money and there is no trade off and that this is a win win. Uh, I personally don't think these arguments are convincing, but that is what the money is trying the story that the money is trying to tell us. I, I got you. Okay, Brian. Is there a contradiction between the moral imperative and the financial uh, gains? Not necessarily. I, I think it it is what has happened. Um, the the opportunity was was seen to say that we can we can do both, and so that it's been embraced. Whether it is a contradiction, kind of remains to be seen. I think the um, if if being more moral causes you to gain more business or causes your employees to perform better, it can be very consistent. On the other hand, uh, we know that sometimes these things are at odds with each other where the more profitable way is not the moral way. And, and so if you make, you can certainly make the choice to do both without it being inherently contradictory, um, but it's difficult because if the other, if the other businesses involved aren't doing the same things, then competitive pressures make it difficult. Um, so I think potentially contradictory, but not not inherently. Okay, so the way it plays out is, or way it could play out is that faced with a choice, business will choose one over the other. And yes, that business, would businesses would like to deny that there's a contradiction because that um, is a very convenient message. And of course, as Brian's pointed out, sometimes there isn't a contradiction. Sometimes there is convergence between morals and money, and sometimes there isn't. So, but but a lot of the conversation in in the mainstream discourse at the moment um, suggests that this is all always uh, a win win. Uh, better ESG performance correlates with better financial performance, um, and there's nothing else to discuss. Okay, so this so is we've 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 basically landed on the idea that the best way to measure the success of an approach that was designed to get us beyond an obsession with shareholder returns is whether it drives shareholder returns. We have landed on a very strange circular argument. 
A circular argument, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I entered the diversity field with the business case for diversity as the big thing to argue. And then, yes. came, and then came people said, what about it for its own sake? What about the contribution to society? Right. What about all of that? So, Brian, I want to go back to you and ask you, what about that? Because you're, you're, you're saying, and I agree with, I was raised on that. I'm talking about for my prof professional diversity upraising, that there, you need to promote the business case for diversity, the business case for sustainability, else corporations won't do it. The name of the article is incentivizing ESG. Does it, what does it really take? Give us the bottom line of the answer to your question. What does it really take? Well, I, I guess the, the problem you run into is uh, when incentives are involved, uh, we, don't, we don't know if the things are being done anymore for moral reasons or because of the incentives. And so what is, um, is it for the sake of being good? It could be, um, but not if there's incentives involved, it's likely the case that you're being driven to receive the incentives. Uh, and, and those always bring with it their own, their own difficulty. And the fact that if there's an incentive, whoever's providing that incentive is actually the decision maker. Um, the control or the um, incentive coming in, um, it frees you of the responsibility to decide what to do, but also um, uh, means that you you sort of are asked for compliance rather than um, morality, and, and and that's often where it's leading, right? Where the the leaders are given the answer to the question, the difficult questions. If you just do this, you'll be viewed as good, and so they do that, and it it usually works. It's usually pretty simple. They get for the most part viewed as good. But is that the most good we could be doing instead of actually having people make moral decisions? I, I, I'd say it's probably not optimal in that way in that um, there tends to be a lot of just doing what everyone else is doing um, and these sorts of things. So um, my, my bottom line answer to what does it take to, to incentivize ESG like more appropriately would be to actually reward innovation um, in that area getting results in your own way, telling us what you're gonna do, following through on it and showing that it was the right thing to do all along, rather than asking, what do you want me do, to do to be happy? Um, what, what do I have to do to meet the next challenge? What do I have to do to not be um, uh, in the doghouse? And that it seems to be that that's not where we're at. We're, we're more um, giving clear incentives or easy to reach behaviors and instead of um, asking ourselves what's right and and yeah. later showing what what can you do prove us impress us we don't say that anymore we say comply um, and you'll be rewarded wow this is goal setting theory i don't know if y'all are familiar with that but this sure. is way yeah. back this is Locke and latham's goal setting theory and uh, how intrinsic Motivation is undermined by extrinsic rewards. That's basically what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, there's, we, we wrote, um, we shared a recent paper at Ethical Systems uh, called Instrumental Use Erodes Sacred Values. And the right there. Hang uh, on, say that phrase again. That's a lot of words and it's really important. Instrumental, instrumental use, use uh -huh. erodes sacred values. Yes. So the researcher did work um, and diversity was one of the things she explored. And she found that when you message to people uh, that, uh, so corporations have got the idea that they need to message around the business case. We will solve climate change because that's how we're going to make more money over the long term. We will put more black people on our senior leadership team because there's all this data showing that more diverse teams perform. And this researcher found that that kind of messaging, people find it gross and off-putting and it undermines the goal in the first place. People, if something is a sacred value, something is a value that, that people hold sacred, whether that is diversity or environmental um, 
responsibility and then you message around the business case, it undermines the effect that you're trying to have. Holy Toledo. I did not know we were going to come and have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is downright fascinating to me because I had never applied it at the corporate level. I believe it or not, I've applied it at the community level. Right. The work that I've done, but I had never applied it at that level. So incentivizing. So the ch uh, challenge is how to make distinguish between a reward and a bribe basically uh yes and how to and, and how to figure out what you incentivize with rewards and bonuses and goals and targets and what you make a fundamental ethical obligation that you punish if somebody breaches it that's our argument that you need to differentiate you can't just tick the box the example we use in the article is, is, is McDonald's setting diversity targets for its senior leadership team. And we're saying you can't tick the box on that and think you will solve your wider diversity problem. Right. Good stuff. Okay. Um, let me back up and ask a fun, another fundamental question. Then I'm going to come back to where we are now. But I just want to clarify What's the connection between environmental, social, and governance? Why are you putting those three in the same realm? And that's uh, because, Brian. Sure. Sorry, you asked me? Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, you know, the, the industry, not us, has done this. Or, you know, I, and I think you know that it's been the evolution. Um, I would agree with the idea that it was CSR became ESG or ESG came along as a different idea and replaced it, either, either one of those. The e ESG. ESG. So, um, Wait a minute, I, you know, I think on, there, Brian. You said the SG. Are you using a No, new sorry. E no, ESG. Still, oh, ESG. ESG. Okay. okay. Yeah, CSR was either the older term for the same thing or the uh, so what was that? less popular. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop you on all these initials. No problem. Okay. So, so ESG, social responsibility or social CSR, responsibility. Okay. So start, start, take that from the top. What to, you say. to simplify a, a little bit is the old term, the old way of thinking. And you could either say it evolved into or was replaced by ESG. And social, social responsibility initially, then envir yeah. environment, social, and governance was the evolved term. Yes, yeah, I, and the UN coined it in 2005. We didn't come up with this. Okay. And, I, and I think the evolution there is that it's broader. The idea is that we went from, um, before CSR, it was businesses have to follow guidelines and then make all the money they want. That was about it, right? And so then it was, no, they have a responsibility that's larger than themselves. And now it's to the planet to, to people uh, uh, on the larger meaning of that, people wherever there's impact. And, um, you know, it's, I think the reason it includes all three of those is because we acknowledge that it interacts with governance, which means not just government governance, but governance within an organization, who is in charge, who's making the decisions um, and how is that done? So yeah, the leadership is doing what they do because of who, who is, who they're governed by. So to me, I would say it includes all of those to show that now the, the global social environmental impact of a company is the focus, not just the simpler idea of being responsible. Um, and, and so it's, it's broadened to that. Not everyone likes it. Um, some people would say it's going too far, but at least we can think on that level and say, what are the, the impacts, the broad impacts name everyone impacted and ask ourselves what should be done about that and if they have a say and you know again the planet being one to say you know it does do they have a responsibility not just to pollute but maybe to do more things like that okay so you're saying before it was just a generalized be more responsible but then when you parceled out when the un parceled out global social environment now it gave a focus to their efforts is that the point you're saying? 
Well, I'd say it broadened the effort um, and 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 basically said that you know who are they responsible to is now the the broadest possible category, which is everyone that they may they may affect, as well as you know social includes just remembering the social the social factors inside your own company, but that can go beyond just mere responsibility, right? To saying um, what are we doing, what is the impact of our business activities uh, on the social ecosystem inside and outside of your company. Um, I think that's all in play. What what you're actually expected to do is a different question, but to to say that it's gone to that that next level of uh, an even broader focus. So to remain focused, but with a broader scope. Okay, so Allison, is there a connection between, is there a trend line between co companies on how they deal with governance, social, and environment that are those connected? Let me let me put it another way. There was there's been this fight about whether or not the environmental folks were really concerned about diversity, or whether the diversity folks were really concerned about environment. And what I, as a researcher, what I have observed that is people who believe in one tend to believe in the other. You'll have some folks who don't, but that they go hand in hand. So what I'm asking you is at the corporate level, is it so that companies that tend to be socially responsible or also tend to be environmentally responsible? Does that go hand in hand and to set up governance for that, or is that separate? Are they distinct things? Um, it's a really good question. So I think that the UN effort and the rise of investor interest in these topics comes from the idea that corporations should stop treating their negative impacts on society and the environment as just externalities that have nothing to do with the business. So it comes from a rise of investor focus on the consequences of negative externalities kind of on the world. And then the UN, I think, put governance in at the last minute um, is what I've been told, partly because there was more evidence on the business case for good governance leading to um, to a better financial value. But the, I think the origin is more concern about the negative externalities of corporations. This is, is, is how this kind of came about. There's other interesting data showing that there has been a rise in intangible value, right? So it used to be that how corporations made monies was plants, machineries, cash, buildings, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there has also been a rise um, in in intangible value versus tangible value. So now corporate valuations are much more dependent on reputation, brand, IP, network effects, essentially social license to operate. So I think the rise of awareness and concern over externalities and then the rise of intangible value really explain the rise of ESG. Now, I'm not answering your question, but I'm about to. Okay. So then you're asking, is there um, a correlation between environmental and social responsibility? So the other thing about ESG is that it argues that you should look at the most material factors to your business. So you don't just go and launch a Save the Woodchucks campaign if, you if your business has nothing to do with woodchucks. You don't just donate to charity. You don't just do things out of the goodness of your heart, but you look at the environmental and social issues that are most strategically relevant to your business and you prioritize those. Um, and you're right, I think, that companies that believe in climate change are likely to believe in diversity. Companies that are trying to push this agenda they likely see it as a package. Um, but in reality, I don't think it is a package. If we, if, we, if we just take a very basic example, which is if you shut down a factory, you'll reduce your carbon emissions, you'll also put a thousand people out of work. So there obviously can be trade-offs and there obviously can be contradictions. Uh, the other thing I would say is that no business really performs well on all factors. So. If we take, for example, a mining business, very problematic um, 
uh, impact on the environment, a uh, very problematic impact on human beings in general, but you will likely see uh, quite advanced human rights approaches compared to a company that has less friction and less pressure um, on these issues. So it's pretty complicated. It's not um, that companies tend to be good at everything, at the kind of governance level, at the culture level, at the leadership level. Yes, I think you tend to commit to ESG and commit to these ideas as a package. But the truth is no one's really got the bandwidth, energy or commitment to do the right thing on 30 or 40 things. So um, it's not always true that a company that's great on climate change is also great at, at diversity. Okay, so if I'm hearing you right, and correct me if I'm wrong, companies should look at what's important to them, important to their business, and maximize on the values, the social and environmental values that's relevant to them, because you can't do it with all 40 50, right, 50, 100 50. exactly. And the word for that is materiality. materiality. So people in ESG have thought about, you know, they've thought about greenwashing. They've thought about this being treated as PR. They've thought about companies messaging just as a form of kind of stealth advertising and not doing anything about the issues that are really relevant. And they're also trying to say that this should be part of the core of doing business. It shouldn't be kind of charity or a foundation effort on the side. It ought to be really fundamental to how you're running your business. So both those ideas converge on this idea of materiality, which is that you should find the priorities that are relevant to, to your stakeholders, relevant to you, relevant to your externalities, relevant to your value, and you should focus on those things. Okay, so let's go back to this bribe incentive reward discussion. I'm, one of the reasons I was just so totally excited when I found your article was that I'm just dumbfounded about how to get encouraged. I shouldn't say to get, that's too controlling. How to encourage organizations to move towards uh, more, what I consider to be moral stances. Yeah. Now we know from Jonathan Hate's work, what I consider to be moral standards may not match my neighbor's idea, but still how to move corporations and companies towards wanting to do more to support the environment, towards wanting to increase diversity. In an organization that I consulted in, they set up uh, diversity goals as part of the performance appraisal for the managers. And it was terrific. Managers, one manager took on, I'm not getting along with my female employees. My direct female direct reports don't like me. What do I, I'm going to take this on. Another one said, I want to mentor uh, the minority assistants who have, don't have a chance to break into the professional levels. So they took on really challenging goals. Now that was year one. Listening to you now, and eventually, as I understand it, that whole thing faded away. Listening to you now, I'm wondering if year three, what was intrinsically motivating initially, oh, this is so cool, and I get a reward at the end for doing this, whether in year five, that would have become a compulsory compliance, to use Brian's word, compliance thing, rather than a intrinsically motivating act for the executives. So I'm not sure what my question is, and I hope you can help me with this, but I, I'm trying to figure out how do we do this? Brian's gonna have a better answer on me than me on this. Yeah, I guess the question would be how to communicate to these people the values um, and opportunities related to this. So um, they, they should know that there's an expectation to make progress in these areas, or certainly at least not to have um, problems where say there, there's unequal treatment, but even beyond that to make progress and to be, to be said, 
uh, to be told you you know what it is that we value and that you're expected to always work within those guidelines. And here's where we would like there to be progress. And um, we trust that you can come up with a plan for doing this and that you'll come back to us with results later. Um, that is probably the, the, the way to do it, but that's hard because uh, as you said, and we're all guilty of it, what you really want is to make them do it. <laughs> and we would say it's probably better to ask them to do it. So of course, make sure that they're, they're aligned on values, that they know that that's what's expected and to say, hey, impress me with how you can make progress in this area and, and, and then see what they can do with it. Uh, the problem is there's risk there. There is risk that they don't um, in year one do much good at all because you didn't make them. Uh, but we really like when things are our ideas, we really like when um, we can, can have our own creative solution. You know, we call it autonomy over how to get our work done. At the highest levels, people have more of that and not less, the higher need to know that they are responsible for coming up with good ideas, responsible for making them work. And um, again, with risk, there is a good chance they come to you with something better than what you could have mandated. And you say, wow, I, I didn't even know you could, you could have done something this good, but you have to give that trust, the time and, and communicate the values the expectations and give them a chance to impress. And the, the consequence shouldn't be not getting a bonus if the progress isn't being made, but to worry about their job. Um, and to say, not that it has to be, you know, super harsh, but just in terms of, think about it. If this is truly important as a core value of your company, it's not, it shouldn't be an incentive. Allison said this already, it should be an expectation that you you operate as if this is true. Um, and they should know that. It shouldn't be too difficult uh, in most cases. Okay, so the, so the solution is to make it clear, and this is what Allison was saying before, make it clear that this is the moral, this is the value of, of the company, this is what we expect, show us how you're gonna do it. Show us how you're going to fulfill this. And if you fulfill this, let me, play it out. If you fulfill this, then there could be rewards and bonuses and recognition and whatever forthcoming. And if you don't, do you want to be here? Yeah, and it depends what the what the specific thing is. There are certain things that are expectations and um, a bare minimum. And those are the ones that, you know, would be related to to continue in the position. And then there are others that are aspirational and maybe we, none of us know how to solve them, um, but you can, you can ask for their best effort to, to innovate that solution. And one of the best things you would get there, I think is possibly longer term solutions where they look at core um, root issues, because if you demand it happens this year, there's a limited set of things they can do to make it happen this year, the way they can make it happen. Um, and so the more systemic, or things we've been talking recently a lot about pipelines as a thing when you look at say diversity and hiring um these reach back years into people's job preparation and often that's where the divergence in in the equality is it's not in being given a fair opportunity today it's in uh, making those job choices knowing that those things are available um choosing certain careers these sorts of things um so so if, if it's a value and not a this year, um, we need this percent change, it would be deeper. Um, but again, there's always these risks. You have to say there's risks, it's slower. It might not happen at all. Um, and that's the scary part, I think. So we go with strict, easy to follow, um, really desirable by the public and investors kind of things. Um, and. And there's, there's some value in that, I think, right? To make sure that you're not being viewed negatively or falling too far behind, but it's not, it's not everything. Okay, so Allison, we've been talking at the individual, interpersonal manager to employee or direct report level, take the same principle and at a macro level. We're now at some corporate board of directors. 
and they have to make some decisions about whether or not uh, to fold the mining company or whether or not to drill in Alaska or whether or not to whatever. They have to make some decisions. What's to incentivize them to, and I, to put environment first? It's a really good question. Um, and I think, you know, I would, I would come with the same answer, which is that you need, um, you need to have a, a values commitment that is made by the company that you care about the environment. Uh, there is a lot um, uh, of thinking that if you put uh, public goals out there, lots of people making a net zero commitment, for example, um, that that will be helpful. Um, and then, you know, now uh, a large proportion of the S&P 500 is putting in place ESG goals, especially for senior leadership. So the thinking is that we should make this part of the incentive scheme. Now, um, I think it, it, it starts to get problematic when we start to incentivize ticking the box. Um, and so- Seeking the- uh, Ticking the box, ticking the box. So we say- Oh, ticking we, the box. Okay. Yeah. I, I have a Southern so, accent and you have an English accent. So we're, <laughs> we're trying to make uh, it- Yeah, I'm sorry about my accent. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry understand. about mine. So keep going. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think, you know, I, I think we do, I think we need um, companies to uh, decide what their values are and make them public and make, um, you know, that very, very clear, clear to anyone that's thinking about working there, thinking of that, making that clear to anyone that's thinking about buying from this company. I think it also makes sense to incentivize performance, to incentivize something other than meeting shareholder returns on a quarterly basis. Where I think things start to get tricky is how to design those incentives so they don't have problematic unintended consequences, either of ticking the box or duking the stats or lying or using greenwashing or wokewashing or that they're um, too narrow. So we say that diversity is the same thing as having two diverse board directors or a woman in the C-suite. Or And we say that that solves all the problems. And, and that's what Brian and I wrote our article about because what we see is a lot of uh, incentive design that we believe will not have the intended consequence. And so the question we were trying to answer is if you wanted to incentivize doing the right thing, how would you go about this? What is more likely to work? Right. So let's take the consumer. Allison, you have written a lot of stuff about should CEOs speak out? Should corporate corporations have, should, could uh, you didn't do could, uh, somebody else did could uh sh should consumers boycott businesses that they politically disagree with all of that i'd like to hear both of y'all's opinion of that as part of our closing so let's sure. Allison first sure so um the big the big problem i have um around this whole topic is that what we have seen, and I think we've seen this, um, let's just stick to America. <laughs> we've seen in the US um, over the past uh, six or seven years, a complete transformation in the kind of rhetoric that the average big business is pulling out there. The example I have, have given a lot in the media is uh, in 2014, right? Michael Brown was shot on the street in Ferguson and left to die. Um, there were protests. And in general, the corporate world did not want to touch this with a barge pole. There were a few exceptions, but no one wanted to talk about it. No one wanted to go near that topic. Just considered something that a CEO would not say anything about. Fast forward to 2021, we have CEOs all over America talking about the verdict in the George Floyd murder and giving their personal opinion on it. So that's a very, very dramatic change in a period um, of seven years. 
uh, that has had good and bad consequences. Um, that was is a would be a very very long conversation if we were going to kind of try one and, and dive in there. But one the sentence one on point. each. I want to hit one sentence on the good consequence, one good consequence, and one bad consequence. Um, I think a good consequence has been that by making these statements, CEOs have opened up um, an, the Overton window of debate and discussion. Once you have said that you are prioritizing something other than shareholder value, once you have said that corporations should have values, you have opened up a space for debate and negotiation in society. You've opened up a lever for employees to hold you more accountable. You've opened up a, a, a new conversation. Okay. The bad consequence is what I was about to say, so this is perfect, which is that speech has not mirrored action. So um, what we see is a lot of grandstanding for brand advantage, divisive grandstanding for brand advantage. We see a lot of black squares on Instagram. We see a lot of um, really cynical PR that is not uh, mirrored either by action or even more critically mirrored by what these companies are doing on their political spending. So you will see uh, companies saying, here is my commitment to net zero and climate change. And those same companies are by their government relations departments funding climate denying politicians. You see, uh, no one's really said anything about the end of robust suede, but a lot of companies are providing benefits. A lot of those companies are providing benefits and also uh, supporting politicians that are trying to undermine women's reproductive rights. So the negative consequence is that the hypocrisy has not been resolved. Well, I'll pick up from where she ended up with hypocrisy. Okay, okay and then I'm reading from something I have. Uh, corp companies, this is off the website, companies also frequently tout feel-good sustainability initiatives while undermining their programs with lobbying and tax avoidance. This is something that Allison just mentioned as a negative consequence of CEOs speaking out and making public their values. Do you regard that as a negative consequence? Do you see other negative consequences? And is this negative consequence worth doing it anyway? Um, so when we when we think about you know the the change that's happened, especially that now companies are becoming political or socially active, um, speaking out on issues. Um, really, what I see is if you think in the broadest terms, the the power around these topics shifting around. Um, to go way back, a business wasn't really involved at all. Their, their job was acceptably to make money. And then individuals with that money um, made political choices with that money, right? And social choices with that money. Um, a problem that we talk about as this power shifts to companies is that it then shifts down, uh, downstream to consumers. So we're worried that there may one day be, this would definitely be, I would say negative, but companies that serve political factions and say that, you know, this is, uh, we talk about there being red versus blue companies for different products and services. Um, if the companies are being so public in their statements about um, political and social issues, then customers or investors gain the power over those things. So the, the larger ESG movement could centralize that power with the investors to determine what is right. Or it could be um, balkanized, so to speak, by consumer groups and who they choose to support and boycott. Um, all of that seems really dangerous to me. The, the upside is that people care and that you're no longer allowed to say, this isn't our problem. The downside is that we're now chasing around the power to make all these decisions and it's, it's going to change hands. Um, it's it's going to end up being a combination of those groups, consumers um, banding together or um, whoever really pulls the strings when it comes to ESG, the investors, the larger investors um, determining what is moral. Um, and, and so those are the things I would worry about because they both sound really problematic uh, to say so that there's this the top decision? down or bottom up problem. Um, I don't know that I have the answer to that. I, I, I don't have an objection to individuals making that decision. The problem we have 
Um, and that would be probably my general bias to say, yeah, well, in, individuals can choose these things. Um, the problem with that is just that um, I think the individual has decreasing um, power in society, right? So um, the power of businesses, even relative to government has grown and certainly relative to individuals. Um, so maybe that's why we look at them and say, we care so much today about what they have to say. Um, but uh, I, I don't have any answers here. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I have concerns, which is just, we need to watch this and think of it for what it is to say that the power to decide what is moral is shifting to two really odd places, consumers and where they spend their money and very, very large companies that determine who gets investment dollars. And I don't have a solution at all. I really don't. Um, but I think it's an important uh, problem to, to, to think of in that way and say- Believe it or um, not, this that's is what's one happening. of the problems that wake me up at night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, not my grandchild going to school. She's gonna be fine going off to college. That's not what wakes me up at night. The future of what we're talking about right now is what wakes me up and makes and and goes between scaring me because I don't have a solution either. Allison, final comments. Um, I think the re I think uh, the final comment I'd make is that a lot of the story we've been telling, um, I think, is a story of political failure and social policy failure. And so one of the reasons that we um, uh, have turned to business to solve these problems is that we no longer trust the political process and we no longer trust social policy to solve these problems. So there's an outlet, we can boycott a brand. Uh, my young students, my impression is they sort of have this idea of, well, I could stand in line to vote once every four years in a gerrymandered system where my vote doesn't make a difference or I can vote with my dollars and I can vote with my voice and I can decide where to work and I can pressure my employer. Now they're right, but um, are we um, giving young people the impression that corporations are political actors, that a corporation is a democracy, that employees and consumers um, are the electorate? Where are we even going here? So, um, I think this is all about political failure and I do get concerned that uh, consumers, which is a funny word, right? The public ought to re-engage with um, our political crises in this country. Um, and maybe we're expecting a little bit too much if we're expecting business to solve these problems. Wow. I have to, I'm, I'm reflecting on that. So we're expecting too much from the corporations to solve these problems. Just putting myself in your class, I would think, but it's the corporations who buy the politicians. Exactly, exactly. So corporations are saying, hey, 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 we're really responsible. We really care about diversity. That's what they're saying. And then on the back end, they're doing what they've been doing all along. Okay, Brian, final thoughts. Uh, I agree with that. A lot of that was um, something that I, I can't say as eloquently, but I, I, I feel it and I agree with that. It, it's it's the, the problem seems to be that where we've lost faith in institutions, that loss of faith is not only understandable, but seemingly just plain legitimate. And so of course we're looking for new ways to, to have um, an influence on, on the world. And um, some of these things may just be a little bit out of our reach. And um, so we know that maybe collective action is what we need. So we look to the, what are the biggest groups? What are the biggest sources of power and money that could do things in its businesses? And so we apply the pressure there. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Some of these problems that we say we need to address um, we want to know what will it be like in 10 years if we don't address them. Um, I, I feel certain that we'll find out. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. um, so place, place your bets now. And um, uh, unless something drastic happens, and that's one reason I focus on innovation and things like that, because if, if someone, if there's pressure, of, you know, on, on the larger scale for people to come up with truly innovative solutions that might that might change the fundamental 
mathematics behind some of these problems because there's there's a reward in it for them rather than an easy box to tick but but rather you know to someone to fill that vacuum of leadership and innovation then maybe there's a chance but for the most part i think i think we will we will see where we end up without without addressing these issues um for better or worse and we'll just uh, I, I don't want it to be that way i don't think anyone does but um that's that's my firm belief that we will find out because uh, of that and perhaps those things will um be interesting enough um to to then have us look back with with good uh you know the 2020 vision of hindsight and do better but even that i'm up i'm not optimistic on but it's okay. possible oh, okay <laughs> hang on so i i had said last question but I, this is the real uh, real oh. last question okay <laughs> okay are we trending up or are we trending down Just one oh. word answer. Down. <laughs> you say down. Allison? I think we're trending to a reckoning. I think we're trending to a crisis. Yeah, okay. My husband says that. He says it's going to fall apart before it comes back together. Okay, with that, I thank you both. This has been a delightful conversation. That was a whirlwind of a conversation. Here are my takeaways. First, the critical question is, how do we encourage businesses to do the right and ethical thing for its own sake? The most obvious answer is give incentives. Yes, but then there's the danger that they will stop doing the right thing for its own sake because their values support doing the right thing. And they will instead start doing things that will earn them the incentives and reward. This is what is meant by undermining intrinsic motivation. Instead of doing what's right for its own sake, companies will try to figure out how to comply with the system so they can get the rewards. And the whole idea of doing what's right for its own sake goes out the window. They'll narrow down to doing just that bare minimum that will get them the brownie points or financial incentives, and the whole of supporting factors that will make for a truly ethical response to the situation won't get addressed. Second, there's no easy answer to this. We do want to incentivize corporations for doing the ethical thing since so many don't, but we also don't want to set up a system or a situation where they whole idea is just to game it. So how should we make it happen? What they talked about was the importance of the company having a strong set of values that they return to again and again and again. And they, they tell their employees, we're here for these values. And if you are, you will get these rewards and we will recognize you for it. If you're not, do you really belong here? That minimizes individuals gaming the system. But how can the same thing be said to a corporation? We talked about that, but we didn't have a real answer for it. The last thing is the importance of setting priorities. There are so many things to be done and ethical principles to uphold, that if we want corporations to be accountable or individuals within a corporation to be accountable for ethical principles, we can't expect them to meet all the environmental and social and governance goals that are out there. So the thing is, we encourage them to choose what's relevant to their businesses and focus on maximizing what's good for that, where rather than spreading themselves, trying to beat all the possibilities of what's relevant or what's out there. I learned a lot in this conversation and thoroughly enjoyed it. Hope you did too. Thanks for listening.